Norway, part one, earthing systems. As we mentioned before, there are three ways to determine whether fault loop impedance is okay or appropriate. The first is to measure the fault loop impedance. So how do we go about doing that? So let's have a quick look at our circuit here. Just change my pointer to a pen. Here we have the winding, one of the windings in our transformer connected to our star point. Of course, this is only one winding shown here. There are another two windings that uh, are not shown on this particular drawing. I'll just very roughly draw my other two windings in here. There they are. And we're on the third winding. So the current has to flow through the supply authority's mains um, to the point of attachment. Then it comes into your installation, uh, often through a service fuse in here. Then through your main switch. And then often through a sub-circuit protective device into your load. And in this particular case, we have a fault in our load going to earth. Here's the protective earth along here, coming back to our neutral link. And of course, our neutral link has an MEN in it. So it is connected to earth, but our protective earth is also connected back to the neutral at this point. So current can then flow back to the neutral point at the substation, hopefully creating enough current to flow here to operate our protective device. So we need to keep the impedance as low as possible, or the AC resistance as low as possible, but this loop that I've just drawn around is what we call the fault loop. So the loop impedance, so the whole loop impedance is made up of the active coming in, the earth itself, and the neutral back to the substation, and the impedance of the transformer. If you haven't already cottoned on, uh, TX is an abbreviation for transformer and the transformer itself has an impedance which allows for the amount of current that can be provided from the secondary side of the transformer. Oh, sorry, from the primary side into our secondary side. So all of these will limit the current and dictate the fault level that will flow. So let's have a look at how that might happen. So the first thing we need to understand is we have this table from AS3000 called, uh, this is table B5.1, and it may have just got cut off on my slide a little bit, so I shall just write that on the screen here. So this is table b 5.1 and the first thing you'll notice is that we have uh, conductor sizes over on the left hand side and we've got our active conductors in square millimetres, we've got our earth conductor in square millimetres. Our protective device, so our circuit breaker rating effectively, that's what that is here in this column in amps. And then our circuit breaker. And you see it says C note 1. Now this is note 1 down the bottom here in the red box. This down here you can see a little asterisk. This is note 1. And it's telling us that there are different types of circuit breaker characteristics. There's characteristic type B, type C, and type D.
And it's also telling us that for type B, we have to allow four times rated current, for type C, seven and a half, and for type D, 12 and a half. And if you don't have circuit breakers, but you have fuses, now again, you'll see it says C note two, these are for um, standard, I believe, HRC fuses. So this table tells us the maximum length we can run in meters for our active and for our earth, depending on the current rating of the circuit breaker and the distance that we need to actually travel or the distance of the length of the cable. So when they say circuit length, they actually mean the length of the cable. So that's what this table is telling us. So again, here's our different types of characteristic curves. There's a type B curve, a type C curve, and a type D. And just to reiterate again, type B needs to be four times rated current to trip in the appropriate amount of time. Type C needs to be seven and a half times the rated current, and type D needs to be 12 and a half times the rated current. And this is why. So here is a circuit breaker characteristic curve. It's not any particular curve, it's just a curve. And on the horizontal here, we can see my cursor. You've got one times the current of the circuit breaker. Up here is four times the current of the circuit breaker. So that horizontal is current. And on the vertical, we have time. So time 10 to the minus 1 means 0. So here, 0 time, 1 second, 10 seconds, 100 seconds, 1,000 seconds. I'll just turn my pen on. So, if you're pulling one times current here, and maybe we should, let's just draw a circuit breaker, give it a value so you've got something to work with in your head. So, let's say I have a 10 amp circuit breaker. So, at one times, I've got 10 amps flowing. If I've got 10 amps flowing, my line never touches the circuit breaker trip curve. Right? So, this is called the trip curve. Trip. The trip curve. There we go. And the trip curve has two sections. It has a thermal section and it has a magnetic section. That's why they're often called combination circuit breakers. They combine two characteristics. They combine a thermal characteristic and a magnetic characteristic. If you can see from the curve, the magnetic characteristic is looking for instantaneous operation because it's perfectly vertical. The thermal characteristic will trip over a certain period of time. So let's say I now have two times, for example. So I go to here to two times. You'll notice as I project up here at two times, I'm going to hit the curve about there. So if I'm drawing 20 amps, which is two times, so here's my 20 amps, it's going to take nearly 100 seconds, right? A minute and a half. So somewhere up here, about...
90 seconds for the circuit breaker to trip. So the circuit breaker is going to continue to hold in on that point at two times current for a minute and a half. What if I go to two and a half times? Go up to here. So 2.5 times. All right. There's about 30 amps of current now flowing. Sorry, it would be 25, would it? Let's make it. Let's make this three. Make more sense. So three tens to 30. There's 30 amps. So. Let's project up here now. Project across. And that's about nine seconds. So at 30 amps, with this particular curved circuit breaker, I'm going to trip at 30 amps. If I've got a, my load goes up to 30 amps on a 10 amp circuit breaker, it's going to take about nine seconds to trip. But let's go now to four times. So four times is obviously 40 amps. So I've now got 40 amps of fault current flowing through my circuit breaker. And at 40 amps, I'm on this part of the curve and I'm going to operate in zero seconds. So there's a fault level of 40 amps. I'm going to trip immediately. But a fault of 20 amps, will take a minute and a half. A fault of 30 amps will take nine seconds. A, a fault of 40 goes into the magnetic section of the curve and it will trip in zero seconds. So that is how the trip characteristic of a circuit breaker operates. And different circuit breakers have different trip characteristics, as we will see. Here's the trip characteristic for a C type. So this one, you don't get instantaneous trip till seven and a half times. So this is what we call a C curve circuit breaker. C curve is a much longer period for a C curve To get to instantaneous trip. Here's our one times. So again, let's let's draw our circuit breaker. Here's our circuit breaker. Our switchboard. We'll pick 10 amps again because it's nice and easy to do the the math. So at four at uh, at one times. So at 10 amps, it's never going to trip, which is what we want, of course. We don't want it to ever trip at 10 amps because it's a 10 amp circuit breaker. But if I now go up to four times, which is going to be about here, we'll just jump up to four times. Here's 40 amps. And I project up onto the curve. I'm not too good at drawing straight lines. Across to here. So there's 10. 10 seconds, yeah, it's going to be right about probably about 70 seconds there, so about 70 seconds. So it's going to take a little over a minute to trip at four times. Here at um, say six times, so six times, that's going to be 60 amps obviously. 60 amps here, and I project up and across. It's going to take about oh, three or four seconds, probably about four seconds to trip. And it's not until I get to seven and a half times, so I get to 75 amps. that I'm going to get instantaneous trip here at zero seconds. And a 
type C curve is pretty typical for most installations unless you ask for a, a B or a D. C is typically what you'll be given if you don't ask. And again, to get uh, enough current flowing to trip it quickly, we need at least 75 amps flowing in our circuit to achieve a zero or immediate trip. And our third circuit breaker type This time we're looking at a D curve, um, often called motor start. And the reason that we call it a motor start circuit breaker is because when a motor starts, it has often a lot of inrush current. So we might do get up into the instantaneous trip zone accidentally with a type B or a type C. So if you've got a large load that uh, starts up DOL and uh, the motor draws a lot of inrush current, quite often we'll change over to a D curve because you've got to achieve 12 and a half times rated current to get into that instantaneous trip. So giving you enough time for your motor to start. But let's, let's work through it again. So we've got our circuit breaker. And we're going to call it 10 amps again. And at 1 times 10 amps, you're going to get 10 amps. And of course, not going to trip ever, which is exactly what we want because it's operating within the zone. But uh, let's go up to uh, somewhere about here I would say and go five times for example so five times so five times ten is 50 amps so on this D curve characteristic at five times it's going to take somewhere in the order of about oh, what's that about maybe six seconds to trip so you can pull five times and it will take six seconds to trip. So good for a motor, you might pull 50 amps on a 10 amp motor for one or two seconds, but you'll be back inside the safe part of the curve within the six seconds and it won't trip, which is why we call it motor start. Um, we get up here to say 10 times, just to keep the math easy. 10 times, so, Instead of having a hundred, 10 amps flowing, we've now got a hundred amps flowing. So a hundred amps on a 10 amp circuit breaker to there. And it's going to take about 0 0.9 of a second to operate, just under one second to operate. And of course, once we're at 12 times, in our example, that would be about 125 amps, obviously. We now trip instantaneously at this point, so it will take zero seconds. So we have to consider what kind of circuit breaker curve we're dealing with and how much current we need to get to flow to get to this instantaneous trip. All right, this is where we need to get to instantaneous trip. So, back to our little example again, just a reminder. Turn my pen on. Remember, this is my winding here at the transformer. My transformer winding here. So this is back at the substation. Either pole mount or pad mount. 
and in this particular case I'm coming through a 16 amp circuit breaker and of course I would have had my main switch and my service fuses before that into my load I've got some kind of fault occurring on my load to protective earth that's what this here is this is PE protective earth so my fault current now comes down my protective earth and my fault current actually has two directions it can go it can go back to the transformer via the MEN link and the neutral so this is the neutral this is my protective earth and the two are connected here with the MEN but I can also you'll see a smaller line here there can be current flowing back to this point via what we call the body of earth now you'll notice this is a much thinner line much thinner line there is actually reasonably high impedance in here so the impedance of earth is moderately high moderately high it's certainly probably well above zero ohms well above it the difficulty is if we rely on this body of earth to do the tripping of the circuit breaker because the resistance in here could be as high as two maybe to five ohms we will not get sufficient trip current to flow to make our protective device up here do its job and that's the whole problem the whole reason we're doing earth loop impedance is to make sure that the impedances in our circuit are low enough when we add them all up to get sufficient current to make this 16 amp circuit breaker trip depending on whether it's a B curve a C curve or a D curve circuit breaker so the MEN link must be left intact so here all our links need to be left in and we're going to measure from across the active across to the earth so effectively now we've removed the fault the circuit stayed the same we now want to be able to measure the resistance from here across to protective earth therefore measuring the impedance or the AC resistance of this loop of the circuit so in this particular case table B4.1 tells us that a 16 amp circuit breaker as a type C which I mentioned before is typical if it's not marked on the circuit breaker by the way it is a type C by definition so here the telex are type C so here are disconnect times 0.4 of a second less than a second almost instantaneous so we need to end up with a total circuit impedance of 1.92 ohms or less to create enough current for a 16 amp circuit breaker to disconnect in the appropriate amount of time I'll just go through that again and I'll just turn my pointer on so this is table table B41 we're working with a C type circuit breaker because they didn't tell us otherwise we knew it was 16 amps so this is the column that we're interested in across here and it's a C type where the two cross this is the value we're interested in and we know that if our circuit impedance is less than 1.92 ohms 
then we're going to disconnect in 0.4 of a second, which is acceptable. So you can see here our fault loop impedance, the maximum available, 1.29 ohms. Our cold fault loop impedance is 1.92 times 0.8. So if the supply voltage is 240 volts per phase, then we multiply the Z by 240 or 230 or 1.04. So the earth loop impedance would be 154 multiplied by 1.04 equaling uh, 1.6 ohms. If RCD protection is used, AS3000 states that if the RCD operates during the FLI test, then the test result is considered satisfactory. So if you're using a residual current device, that is an earth leakage circuit breaker, and it trips during the process, then we're happy with that because it has tripped. That's what's important. So if the RCD part of the circuit uh, trips, then we're happy with that. So that is lesson um, 12A, part 1, ended. We'll go on with the next one and uh, show you how to do it a second way.